today what I want to do is to give you a really quick overview of the role and potential of computational fluid mechanics in what we call chemical reaction engineering or, or we also call it of course uh, CRE for short. And, and I realize that some of you are not uh, uh, from the chemical engineering side. However, there's a commonality in the, in the work here because in the end uh, the there's a coupling which occurs between chemical reactions as well as physics, and this is where the uh, overlap, of course, occurs in the various disciplines. So you can see here in this opening slide, uh, typically what we do in chemical engineering or in process development, we try to find some new chemistry in order to make some molecule, and that molecule may be, of, of course, of a commercial interest. And then what we have to do is we have to try to develop some type of catalyst which can be used in a commercial size reactor. And catalysts are typically uh, solid, solid inorganic oxides and you see here they come in various sizes and shapes. For example, you see here powders, you see cylinders that have holes in them and you see extra dates and other trilobes and other shapes which are the result of people's imagination. Um, and then what we need to do is take those materials and then basically use an engineering principle to show how this chemistry can be practiced in a large-scale reactor. In this case, this may look like a heat exchanger. What it is, it's a, it's a reactor which contains a large number of tubes. And the, this catalyst, one of these catalyst forms for typically a particle will be placed in these tubes. And then a, then a heat transfer fluid on the outside of those tubes would then maintain that chemistry under desired process control type of like conditions. So today what I want to do is give you a really quick overview of some key aspects <coughs> of this type of technology. Now unfortunately there's a lot of things here that we can talk about and I have to go through some of this very quickly. On the, I have some information on the slides that we'll to take a look at uh, in a post facto fashion. So what we want to do then is we want to look at the development and impact of CFD tools and uh, catalytic reactions and, and reactor engineering to basically point out what are the capabilities, lim limitations, and the potential for addressing emerging, emerging needs. Here you can see an example of a typically randomly packed bed. This, 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 is, this represents, uh, say, particles that might be 10 to 20 millimeters in my diameter. And these particles were placed there using a computer algorithm to simulate the behavior of how a typical packed reactor might, might, might be formed. This on the other side shows the results of a CFD calculation, which shows the temperature distribution and the flows uh, that, that occur in such a 3D packed bed. And here in the middle, they're kind of connected through the numerics. And here we show a typical gridding scheme that might be used in order to uh, discretize the government of equations for such a problem. So, uh, what we want to do is we want to talk about some of the key as aspects of this. And we want to a little, little bit about the history of CFD, how that comes about, how what are the uh, key papers you might want to read about the role of CFD in chemical reactor engineering. A little quick review of the literature, a few things about emerging technologies and future directions, and finally some, some closing comments. Okay, so um, history of CFD. Well, the history of computational fluid mechanics is really driven by the aerospace uh, industry and the development of basically jet flight. If you go back and look in the 1960s, uh, as I illustrated here, the underlying principles of computational fluid mechanics and fluid, uh, and fluid dynamics like for potential flow, oil equations, Reynolds, aver average, uh, and average slopes, these were really well established in the, in the, 19, in the 1960s. Of course, they were used by of course, NASA in doing design and simulation of like spacecraft. Now, one of the key things which really drove the development of CFD was the emergence of computers, basically hardware, that had enough power to solve to solve the equations. Okay, some of you may know on some of the first spacecraft, you know, they only contained uh, computers that had like 4K, 4K of RAM, not like four 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 like kilobytes, but 4K. Okay, so so what happened then as a result of the hardware development is that um, in order to make, take advantage of it, new al algorithms were basically de developed. So, and, and as, as this occurred over the 40 to 50 years, um, we saw the like, emergence of CFD 
in terms of using, uh, taking advantage of the existing uh, computer uh, power, the development of algorithms from a computer science point of view, and the transformation of these algorithms into numerical codes. And of course, now we see the development of various packages. Now, there are a number of things uh, in technology developments in the 60s which accelerated it. And these are illustrated here, basically the birth of uh, commercial jets, um, like, like a 707 and, a D and also DC-8. Significant interest in the development of you know, what we call the transonic drag rise phenomena. And also the basically the lack of analytical treatment of transonic aer uh, aerodynamics, coupled with the development of a supercomputer. And here we see a CDC, or Control Data Corporation, 6600 machine. <clears throat> so, um, so if you look at the advances in, in like computer power, um, it's hard for us to realize uh, what the how the technology has really grown, and at the same time, in terms of speed, while the size of the device performing computing has shrunken as well as the price. So here we see going from 1970 TDC6600 operating at about one one mega uh, floating point operation per second on order order of about 10 to 6 operations on down to our on to our, to our Mac Pro for example our 2011 version that can run at 2.5 gigaflops and at that time it can cost a mere $2,100. Okay? So significant developments have occurred you'll notice the orders of magnitude uh, the change in terms of the uh, amount of processing operations and of course this has increased uh, much more even, even like today. So with the available this hardware then we're then able to drive the development of computational fluid, fluid mechanics because then we were not no longer limited by necessarily computational types of resources. Now, if you want to learn more about the role of CFD and chemical reacting during there's some key, some key papers um, which were published. First year a fellow that worked at the Institut Francois du, 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 uh, du Patrol in Lyon, Pierre, Pierre uh, Tram, Trambouz, he actually wrote one of the very, very first papers that dealt with CFD as applied to chemical reactor engineering. There have been a series of, of, of uh, you know, conferences that dealt with the role of CFD in chemical reactions during the first one held in 1996. The last one was just held, held last year, every other year. And those are very interesting to go back and take a look at because some of the problems that are being trying to solve at that time we're still trying to solve today but on a more larger scale. And also some very key papers which appeared in, in reviews in chemical engineering by um, uh, Professor, now Professor Coopers and Van Van Swy in, in, in Holland. So they're very active, uh, still active today in the utilization of computational flow mechanics and chemical reactor engineering. The subject is also been treated at sessions at the American Institute of Chemical Engineers and every year there is a session or, or two devoted to advances in CFD applied to chemical reactor engineering. I've also included all the links so offline if you want to go back and like, take a look at what some of these things are and what are some of the recent developments um, you might find that very much of interest. You'll notice that a couple of people here have a, a like monopoly on that on that particular session and trying to break that monopoly is trying to get more difficult than trying to get the government to go back to work. Okay, so, but in any case, uh, th these are very useful to go back and take a look. Okay, now, what is it that makes it complicated by using computation fluid mechanics and chemical reactor engineering? The real complication occurs because number one, the types of reactors which are used. Number two, the number of phases which can be present. The simplest being a gas contacting a solid, which may be stationary or that solid may be in the form of small particles which may be in a fluidized type state. And the, other, the other complication occurs because we may even add an, like another phase, like a liquid, and that liquid can either be contacting, as you can see here, a, a, a bed of particles, or it may be even contacting a small particles in what we call a bubble column reactor or a stir tank. So if you look at the various reactor types over here, here you see the packed bed, stationary solids, gases contacting them. Here we have small particles, gas contacting solids. And of course, depending on the types of ranges of flows and particle properties, one can have various types of flow regimes in these, these types of systems. You also can have solids which are like circulating, as shown here, so-called circulating fluid beds. 
in which chemistry, different chemistries are conducted on either side of this particular device. Also, the flow regime in the system uh, is quite different than what you might encounter in a typical fluid bed. Here we have a, like a riser reactor. The riser is considered uh, the, the, size of the, the side of the reactor where most of the reactions occur, used commonly in like petroleum processing. Over here, we get into some more, we get the classical stir tank reactor. In this reactor called bunker reactor, which is developed by shell, gas and liquid, as well as catalyst, gas and liquid flow over this catalyst, but this catalyst is like moving, so this is, this is a moving bed reactor. So all the, all the complications which occur in terms of physics of contacting between these different phases, as well as transport phenomena, uh, in terms of gas liquid transport, heat, heat, heat transport, and chemical reaction, which can occur on the outside of these particles as well as in the porous structure of these materials that can be present. Okay, so what is the key knowledge then that we need to practice uh, chemical reaction during uh, using a, a modernistic approach? The first thing that one needs to understand is what is the reaction mechanism for the chemistry that you're studying and what are the reaction kinetics? Okay? And of course, depending on the application, the number of this, this can be very, very simple or can be very complicated. And here, of course, there's faffing in your, in the chemical engineering department, where you're looking at the use of fundamental computational techniques, computational chemistry, to study how different types of molecules can react on solid surfaces and what are the elementary steps which can occur. So this is kind of a first level of like modeling that looks at fundamental surface type phenomena. The next level is what we go is what we call a particle scale. And here, here we have some examples in which we have a fixed bed a fixed bed of solid particles, maybe five to 10 millimeters in my diameter. Gas flows over, the, over these particles where chemical reactions can occur in the pores. And here you see the results of a computational fluid mechanical simulation in which the, the, the particles are located in the bed in a random fashion. And with such simulations, you're able to show how the gas may flow over these particles and how heat and mass transport effects may occur. Now you can take this to like a particle level here, here's an example of a particle shape that's used in a commercial process. This particular particle is about 20 millimeters in like diameter with about a 6 millimeter hole in the middle. This shows the results of a 3D type of calculation in which we're looking at the modeling of the diffusion as well as transport effects which occur in that particular type of, type of particle. Of course, in, in the end over here, what one wants to be able to do is to couple the what happens on the, on the the surfaces of particles in the particles themselves, and what happens when those are introduced into a flow field. So this is the result of a fluent, a fluent simulation for a gas solid circulating bed. And here you see an illustration of what the solids volume fraction, how that can vary in this system from being very rich on the on the on the down lake side of the of, of like circulating bed, very lean, very lean regions which are shown in the like lighter lighter blue. So, so you can see here that one of the key aspects of doing these types of simulations is to basically the coupling of the various phenomena, the coupling between chemistry, which occurs on a molecular scale, transport effects, which occur on a particle scale, and fluid mixing, and interaction between the fluids and the solids, which occurs more on what we call the reactor scale. Okay, so um, I'm gonna go through these slides very, very quickly, but these give a little overview some recent, very recent works on the applications of CFD in various types of reactor types. Here we have like bubble column reactors uh, shown here. Here we have gas you know, fixed bed reactors, all of which in which we have gas uh, flowing over a fixed bed of particles. In the bubble column we have gas and liquid are contacting small particles which are obtained in a fluidized state. Um, we also have circling fluid beds. Uh, I just showed an example. There's a very nice review here if you learn more about that. Of course, C CFD is used to examine phenomena which occur in so-called microchannels, channels which may be on the order of 50 to say 100 microns in characteristic dimension um, across, and then in terms of length, maybe 500 microns or maybe possibly a little larger. So here we have all the transport phenomena which can occur on a macro scale, can also occur on the, on the micro scale. And there's a lot of work done in single phase flow as well as in two phase flow. That is flow of, of, of gas and solids through microchannels or, or, or gas and liquid through, through these microchannels. 
Now, um, the other thing, uh, interesting aspect about this work is that, of course, chemical reaction engineering occurs in systems of what we consider to be classical chemical reactors. Uh, the thing that can occur in like batteries, in like power systems, okay, as shown here, in like, in like materials uh, in, in engineering. Sometimes when we form complex materials, there's chemical reactions involved. And so computational fluid mechanics can be utilized to explain the behavior of these materials types of formations. Of course, in nuclear re reactors uh, as well. Um, of course, in porous media flows and, for example, um, now, of course, so a lot of interest in shale gas. In this case, we have interaction between the species which are present in the gas as well as the solids which are present and the, um, and the various types of organic matter which, which might be present. We can couple that also with, like, with uh, like material uh, types of deformation processes. Um, here's an example of where CFD was used in an application looking at the formation of, of waxes in, uh, in like pipelines, which can occur if the processing conditions can, can change as a function of, of, of the uh, atmosphere in which the phenomenon occurs. Okay, now, uh, one of the things I'm going to be talking about today is use, use of a software package called COMSOL, and uh, COMSOL Multiphysics as a tool for doing uh, modeling of chemical reactors. And there's a number of interesting applications where this tool can be coupled to thermodynamic packages, for example, to so one can look at rigorous thermodynamics. Um, some, some work has been done in comparing, of course, there's different codes available, which one is best, which one works better. Work down there, the use of like, adapt, like adaptive meshes, particularly in two-phase slug flows to track fronts as bubbles or fluent um, in, a, in a liquid media. Also, of course, in, in China, a lot of work is going on in the use of CFD and you know, like chemical engineering and the entire institutes are being like, devoted to study multi-phase reacting flows. Okay, so um, today what I want to talk a little bit about is about the use of console multi-physics as an engine, if you will, for modeling of chemical reactor systems. The console multi-physics uh, has been around for quite a while, more than 10 years. It's based upon a finite element method, uh, equation-oriented system, in which uh, we have various types of modules which are present, and basically the microscopic forms of various transport laws can be used. So it can be used not only in classical, chemical, mechanical, or like electrical engineering, or civil engineering types of applications, but also applications involving physics where we, any, any type of application mode where we apply some type of transport, transport, transport type of mechanism. Post calculations can be, once you can complete it, or, or in the middle of doing a particular simulation, one could add user-defined equations. Uh, there are various modules which are available which allow to uh, communicate to the outside world. One can talk to MATLAB, one can talk to, through a capo interface, uh, through various other uh, support tools. So it kind of is really a self-contained code one can import CAD drawings uh, from different sources. One can use the CAD tools present to generate a geometry. It has a various, number, various types of solvers which are available <coughs> for solving the equations which you might be using as well as a full menu of post-processing, import, export types of capabilities. Okay, so the first you know, example I want to kind of walk through is this one here where we look at transport kinetic interactions and complex catalyst shapes. Kind of goes back to my opening slide. If you look at commercial processes, <coughs> catalyst shapes are available in various, various forms. Uh, here are some examples. You can see here 12 millimeter hollow, hollow cylinders, 20 millimeter hollow cylinders, trilobes, and so forth. So you can imagine when these are put in, in, in into a flow field, it's important to understand the interaction between the flow field and also the particle. Well, a lot of work is done in industry on trying to identify the optimal shape. And the fact of the matter is, is that the way that they approach identifying the preferred shape is basically through, uh, basically from learned experience over a period of years using like empirical me methods. So here we want to illustrate how one can use modeling to describe what happens on a particle scale, which then could be coupled to what happens on the outside of the particle in, in some type of flow field. Well, why is catalyst shape important? Catalyst shape is important because a factor which we call the catalyst effectiveness factor, which is the ratio of the uh, of observed rate of reaction in presence of transport effects, how that, 
how that uh, is affected, how that compares to the rate which might occur in the absence of any internal gradients that is suppose the particle was always maintained at, at surface con concentration and surface temperature. So one of the key parameters which occurs in that system is what we call the Thiele modulus. And the Thiele square of that Thiele modulus is shown here. It, what it really is is a characteristic time for diffusion and reaction. And we know that as the Thiele modulus in, in, in increases, the time required for diffusion to occur increases. Therefore, this results in a reduction in the calcium effectiveness because the reactants cannot be supplied to the active site uh, where the chem chemistry occurs fast enough to keep up with the, with the demand. So in order to obtain a maximum calcium effectiveness, you want to use a very small particle diameter, but this should be offset at the same time you're trying to minimize the pressure drop. So these are two counter counterposing things. Typically in, in randomly packed beds, we use the Ergen equation to predict, a, uh, predict a pressure drop. So here we want to have we want to minimize the pressure drop by using a, a large particle, but we want to minimize or maximize the effectiveness factor by using a small particle. So someplace in between is where the optimum must lie. There are other key parameters which occur in the development of cattle shapes, and they're shown here. The formula of those particles, their strength, they have to be put into a large reactor. They may fall apart when that happens. So how, what are the heat transfer characteristics? Do the pores have the appropriate pore size distribution, which allow reactants and products to diffuse in and out? So a number of practical parameters which, which come into play. Here's an example of commercial catalysts which are used in oxidation of sulfur dioxide, which is used to make sulfur trioxide, and that is the key ingredient for making sulfuric acid, which is a very important chemical, which is oftentimes prefer is can be correlated back to the to the to the uh, to the economy of a of like a different country. Here we show some different shapes uh, which catalyst suppliers uh, have proposed. Here we see like a so-called 12 millimeter daisy, which basically is a cosine function on the outside with a uh, net diameter of about 12 millimeters in the hole in the middle. Then we go up to these large rings with holes, and then we even have some solid cylinders over here. Now the way these catalysts are made, you, you, you take a support material and you and you put the an alkali promoted um, either potassium or cesium or potassium with like this, uh, cesium along with vanadium pentoxide onto a silica support. So, uh, but if you go and look in the literature how these are, what, what's the science behind it, there really isn't much but with science. Uh, basically, this, these have been arrived at over a period of years and just based upon uh, operating experience. So, so let's, let's take a look at how one could use um, modern techniques to analyze the performance of such catalysts. Um, there are a number of, of key papers. The first work on this was really done in the late 30s by, by T. Late, um, where he described how catalyst activity is correlated back to particle size. And the professor errors at the University of Minnesota did quite a bit of work in examining the behavior of various types of catalyst particles. So if we look at the material balances, um, mass energy balances in these particles, you can write kind of the standard equations, which are, which are shown here in which the rate of diffusion is balanced by the rate of chemical reaction and the uh, rate at which energy basically are, is basically conducted through the porous material. Uh, the effective conductivity of that material is shown here. It must be equal to the rate at which heat is being generated through a combination through the various chemical reactions. Okay? Now, um, one of the key questions which occurs in modeling of, of these systems is what is the appropriate flux model to use. And here I show some of the various flux models which have been proposed to use to examine uh, um, catalyst particles. It's interesting to note that in the case of complex shapes, uh, there really is no analysis that's been done to examine what is the performance of these particles and what is the appropriate flux model which should be used. The classical one is shown here, so-called Wilkie model, but more like rigorous models which account for the um, various uh, other diffusional processes which are not captured in this world model include things like the dusty, dusty gas model. It turns out that um, scientists are starting to look at these equations when they look at modeling of um, the diffusion of gases in porous media that you encounter also in, in, well, in well drilling types of applications. Okay, so the reaction kinetics for SO2 oxidation are shown here. It's a complex rate form in which the rate of uh, the rate of reaction of sulfur dioxide is 
related to the partial pressure of oxygen, the partial pressure of SO2. This is the reverse reaction. It's limited by thermodynamics. Kp is the equilibrium constant for the reaction. And you can see here that it's a complex rate form since it's first order in oxygen and first order in SO2, but it's also like, an, also like inhibited by SO2 and SO3, meaning that if you have high concentrations of SO3, that the rate is going to be slowed down. So it's an example of a complex rate form. The way this reaction works is that it's, it's, it's complicated in the sense that, that, the, that the sulfur dioxide reacts with, with a vanadium-5 species, which is present in the form of like a molten salt, to form the resulting, to form SO3, and to reduce the oxidation state of the vanadium-5 species to, to like vanadium-4. The vanadium-4 is then reoxidized with oxygen to replenish the, the oxygen and reform the, the, the V5 state. Okay, so it doesn't really directly take part in the reaction except through this fashion, okay? Then these, the sulfur trioxide then has a complex e e equilibrium with the with other with the potassium salts which may be present which are present in the system as well as the vanadium pentoxide. So this equation is actually based upon a fairly complicated sequence of elementary steps. Now if we want to model different shapes in the console mobility physics, here's a, an example of doing that. This is a, a catalyst shape that was proposed to be used, um, and here we see an example of how one would create the geometry using console multi physics. This can be done using the drawing tools which are available. So we draw a set of circles and we rotate those, and then we can then remove the material in the middle to form the, the, the catalyst hole. And I'm skipping a lot here, but to basically this is the resulting concentration profiles that would be predicted when one solves the, those equations which I showed earlier. The, the red is the sulfur dioxide. The blue is when the sulfur dioxide concentration is low. So as you might expect, the concentration is high on the surface. It's high any place where the gas can easily access, like in the middle. As it moves in, in, in through the interior, it, it reacts. The concentration of SO2 drops. It forms uh, SO3. So you can see the dark areas of the, of the particle is where the, <coughs> the concentration of SO2 is low. We can get a more detailed picture of what the concentration profiles look like in this particle at various bulk, bulk temperatures. These temperatures are outside particle temperatures on the, on the outside. Here we see what the profiles of sulfur dioxide, oxygen, and SO3 might, might, might be in this case. <clears throat> so as you expect, as you go to higher and higher temperatures, um, the, the, the concentration gradients becomes much more cheap, uh, steep. Here you see a significant consumption of SO2. You see, of course, the gas is being supplied from the outside of the daisy as well as that inner hole uh, shown here. And of course, the maximum concentration of SO3 is going to occur where the SO2 concentration is the lowest. Now you notice over here, when you get to higher temperatures, that the reverse reaction starts to occur, so the rate starts to, starts to slow down. And so therefore, the SO2 and SO3 start to become more approached thermodynamic equilibrium. So this can give insight into the behavior of these different particles. Now we also want to know how does the particle temperature change. And here we see how the profiles inside, inside that daisy vary depending on the outside particle temperatures. So you can see, for example, for a particle that's at 475 degrees, you can see that 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 particle can get very hot. It can get up to about 75 or so degrees hotter than the, than the external external temperature. Here, this is again the hole in the middle. So of course, as you would expect, it's a so lower it's lower than it is uh, in, in the middle of the, of the particle. <clears throat> so you can see here, depending on where you're, what temperature you start with, and this of course would depend on reactor location. One can obtain different temperature profiles in, in, in that particular system. Now, one can now start looking at other catalyst shapes, and these are some shapes that have been studied. And what we found through a combination of simulation work involving diffusion and reaction, as well as making these particles and doing pressure drop studies, we, we found that shapes such as this light bulb shape, for example, are ones that have some of the preferred type of characteristics. So here you can see these are, these are concentration profiles of SO2 shown over here. This is done in like a 3D type of simulation. Here we see resulting temperature temperature profile. So as you might expect, the hottest temperatures are here in the, down in the middle of the particle because it's can, it's can transport heat 
through the ends of the, of, of the particle as well as on the interior and exterior surfaces. So this kind of information is very useful because now what you can do is go back and look at the effectiveness factor parameter and compare how various shapes, how the various shapes compare. For example, if you look at, uh, for example, this this six this 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 12 millimeter daisy, it's a smaller particle. At as various temperatures, you can see how the effectiveness factor varies as compared, for example, to the larger 20 millimeter ring. So you would conclude that that this this particular particle has a higher like effectiveness. You see over here, uh, for example, at the, the 590s, the, how the how differences compare. These, these are the temperatures which occur at the inlet compared to the outlet. So this type of information is very useful in trying to develop correlations between the connection between particle shape and, and also the catalyst effectiveness. Okay, the next thing I want to talk a little bit about is microchannel reactor uh, te technology. This is a very important technology that crosses a number of like, disciplines. And here we see an example of like a microchannel reactor. Um, these, of course, have high surface to volume ratios, uh, high uh, high volumetric productivity. The Reynolds numbers in these channels are, are very low, so we have Lambda flow in these systems. Uh, we can control the resistance time uh, distribution. We have we have a Lambda flow, so you have essentially no uh, no appreciable back mixing in the system, which can impact the selectivity of, of like chemical reactions. They, of course, have. They can be made very cheaply under certain circumstances. Uh, operating maintenance costs are low and low and low power uh, power consumption. And and one of the reasons why we got involved in this area because there was interest in making some uh, toxic chemicals, but making those in small volumes so they could be pr produced upon uh, upon demand, versus making larger quantities of these materials which should be sitting around in, in storage. Okay, so there's a lot of interest these days in natural gas, in like natural gas conversion. Uh, these are various chemical reactions which which can occur when when uh, when you have a natural gas feedstock. The typical starting point is the conversion of natural gas to like syn gas, CO plus hydrogen. Once one has this this inter intermediate uh, gas, one can then use that as a feedstock to go and produce a whole host of chemical of chemical uh, inter inter intermediates. There's a lot of interest these days in what we call dry, the, what's called the dry, the dry re reforming reaction. That reaction is one where, where natural gas, methane, is react directly with like CO2, both of which are of course you know, greenhouse gases, to form to form syn gas. So if we could find out a way to to basically either convert natural gas directly without going through the syn gas step, that would be a major breakthrough because significant capital is spent trying to form the syn gas. So part of a, of a long-term vision in developing novel catalysts, especially with the abundance of, of, of like natural gas, is to develop novel catalytic materials and also processes that would address some of the fundamental issues in activation of, of, of like methane. So one can go directly to some of the higher carbon number intermediates without going through a synthesis of gas step. Okay, one of the reactions that we have studied uh, is the dry reforming reaction, but using solar power in order to provide the energy. Now, if you look here, you'll see that the the, uh, the dry reforming re re reaction is the direct reaction of methane with CO2 and it forms a one-to-one -one molar ratio of CO plus hydrogen. You notice here that the reaction is endo, is highly endothermic. You have to supply energy in order for this reaction to occur. Um, one of the other reactions, of course, is the, is the water gas shift reaction. It's also an endothermic reaction. Uh, which can occur in like parallel and basically is not desired because it like deters from the formation of a, the desired one-to-one -one mixture of CO plus hydrogen. A lot of uh, work has been done trying to identify appropriate materials, platinum, rhodium, nickel, uh, iron-based catalyst. Uh, these are some papers shown here. But there's still a number of technical issues and those include the deposition of carbon, which, uh, which of course it deactivates the, the catalyst. The extent of deactivation can be rapid depending upon the material which is used and also the process conditions. And the other key issue is, of course, the mechanical stability of these materials. Uh, work has shown that under these types of conditions that many of these materials do not have the mechanical strength to be utilized in practical process. Now, if you look at the, the rate kinetics, these have been studied in these, in these systems. Again, the reaction kinetics are complex. 
have a complex form. They depend upon the partial pressures of CO2 and also methane. And the kinetics, uh, of course, are known. This can provide the, the basis for, for, for studies to simulate the behavior of these systems. One of the places that computational fluid mechanics is used, coupled with other phenomena, is in the development of what we call solar-driven reactors. In these types of systems, a concentrated solar uh, radiation is introduced into a, uh, into a particular geometry and where the reactions that I showed on the previous uh, page occurred. Now, these designs, of course, are very complicated and there's a lot of uncertainty with regard to how one would scale those up. There's various designs which you see which are illustrated over here as well. These all require a constant source of, of concentrated solar energy in order for those to occur. Now, um, in order to study those chemical reactions and to understand how they would behave in the presence of concentrated solar radiation, a number of reactors have been proposed uh, to do that, which are shown over here. The riser simulator reactor, like membrane reactors, microscale packed beds, catalytic micro wall reactors. And one of the reactors that we looked at, um, uh, not only when I was at the pump, but also uh, in where I'm currently at now, in like Kingsville, is the so-called T, the so-called T reactor. And basically the T reactor, the way this works is gas flows down a, down a microchannel. There's a, a thin film of cal which is deposited uh, here under the, under the membrane. Um, you have heaters which are d d distributed on the, on the, on the top of, of, this, of this particular membrane. In this case, we're showing five heaters. We have designs that can contain up to seven heaters, which allows one to locally control the temperature in, in, this, in the reaction zone. And in one of the designs, uh, we actually can introduce um, light through an optical uh, um, solar, solar, artificially generated solar energy can be introduced here in the well in order to simulate the behavior of the system that's powered by solar energy. Okay, now, um, smaller is not necessarily simpler when it, when it, when it comes to modeling. This, this, is a, this shows a detailed uh, model uh, that, that couples transport phenomena along with chemical kinetics. So here we have our microchannel in which the gas is introduced. Okay, the, the bottom of the microchannel is a solid, typically maybe like aluminum, for example, in which uh, heat, heat like conduction can occur. Okay, here on this part of the, uh, of the channel is where you might have a thin catalyst film. So on this film you have heat, you have heat conduction occurring in it, and you have simultaneous heat conduction as well as surface catalyzed reactions occurring on this, on this film. One can have heat, heat heat conduction occurring up here in the silicon nitrine layer, which is used to bond the catalyst film to it. And of course, you also have your platinum heaters. Uh, here we show three, three, three heaters. Here you have, of course, heat, heat, heat conduction along with a uh, combination of convection as well. And depending on temperature, one can have, of course, for radiation heat transfer. In, inside the channel, one has the kind of knob slopes equations, which describe the flow. The energy balance equation that describes the transport of thermal energy present in the system. Um, we also have the species transport uh, uh, equations, uh, which are shown here. So all these represents a nonlinear couple system, which can be solved to basically predict how a microchannel reactor would work and how the how the chemistry of the and the choice of catalyst impacts the formation of the corresponding products. This is, illustrates the, the velocity profiles, how the velocity profiles develop in that system. And of course, in the front end, as you enter the reactor, you're still not fully in a fully developed flow. As you flow down the reactor, you eventually approach a lambda type of velocity, velocity profile. Now, one can then simulate the reactor using those kinetics, and one could get, get, try to get, develop some insight into what is the effect of various hydrodynamic parameters. Here we show here we show how the how the methane to CO2 molar ratio uh, how that uh, how these various ratios affect the corresponding methane concentration profiles. Here we see Reynolds numbers, very low Reynolds numbers, up to order 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 of order of 10. So basically, the flow here is of course just mainly uh, not, not a whole lot of uh, convection occurring in this case, a slopes type flow. Well, down to one we have a we had do we do have some convection occurring. So it turns out that this shows, of course, uh, how the how the coupling between the the, the, the 
the flow of the heat transfer phenomena, how that impacts, uh, how that can impact the concentration profiles and the, and the re reactivity which can occur in this particular system. Okay, so some other, other results of that of the similar type. And this shows, of course, as you change the methane to CO2 ratio of the feed, how that feed composition impacts, impacts the concentration of methane in that system. Now, in order to develop such tools, we try to, we work toward trying to couple uh, the use of CAD tools to develop new micro-reactor design concepts. And here we can show, show how that works. So we have a, say we have a reactor design concept, or in this case, a micro-mixer shown. So we, we, we can draw that in, in, in the CAD. We can produce a 3D structure. That 3D structure uh, contains a series of like components, uh, as shown here. In this case, we have a series of blocks which hold, which with, a, with a gasket at the top, and here you have a, a T type of micro reactor channel. The, the fluids are entering uh, the bottom and they exit here through the, through the end. And then we can then take those, we can import those into console both in physics, and we can have a, an interface which allows us to really simulate various types of designs. This actually was part of a project we worked on, um, sponsored by the National Science Foundation, in, in trying to develop tools that could be used to quickly uh, do prototyping for diverse types of microprocess process systems. Okay, the, the next thing I want to talk about, and the last thing, is an example of using complication fluid mechanics in, in bubble calm reactors. In a, a, a bubble calm reactor is a system in which gas is contacted with a liquid, um, liquid solid mixture, the solid being, being the catalyst. Oftentimes there are heat, heat exchanger tubes located in these systems to control the thermal temperature profiles. But one of the key design issues is how does the, the how are the how do the internals impact the mixing in the system, and how does one optimally locate these internals to control temperatures in, in, in the system? And in, in a bubble column reactor, typically the length to diameter ratio can vary anywhere from two to twenty. The gas superficial velocities can go up to about five meters per second. Typically, the superficial velocity of gas is much, much greater than the superficial velocity of the liquid, and the particles typically range up to about 50, up to about 50 microns. Over here in this side of the slide, you can get an idea of the temperature and pressure ranges, which are used for various types of chemistries. For example, we see in some system like the partial oxidation of ethylene to acid aldehyde, a, a relatively low pressure, uh, of three atmospheres, 130 to degree C. On the other hand, you go down to something like a like a fission trope synthesis, where you convert CO and hydrogen into fuels and chemicals. You see the temperatures are much higher, and of course the pressure is up to about 200 bar or so. Okay, so we have a range of process conditions, but it's important to develop insight into how does one configure these types of reactors. Now, one of the key parts of you know, computational fluid mechanics and chemical reaction engineering is basically using experimental tools to validate or to find insight into what is the nature of the, of the flows. And what this slide shows is a, is a, shows a, a computer tomography system that was, that was at Washington University in St. Louis, um, where I've done some uh, work um, with, with people there. And what this is basically uh, used is in order to, is used to measure the holdup profiles in multi-phase types of systems. The, the, the principle of operation is one where you have a nuclear source, which is located in this annulus, along with an array of gamma ray detectors. Okay, this entire assembly you see here, this is the gamma ray source with proper shielding. This entire assembly is located on the table. This table driven by a, driven by a separate motor, it can move up and down. We also can rotate this table in the angular, uh, in the angular direction. So, so one can basically program this to sit at a particular location and to measure scattering which occurs and by appropriate calibrations one can then use this information to obtain holdup profiles. So this shows a cold flow section of a bubble column in action with like a gas liquid flow. Okay, so this shows what a typical holdup profile might uh, be in a, in a system running at about two centimeters per second of gas. Okay, this is like a like a like a twenty like a like a twenty centimeter um, twenty centimeter test uh, 
test section, the red being the region of high gas holdup, the blue being the um, region of lower, lower gas holes. You can see here that you kind of have a non-homogeneous 3D um, type of uh, vortice, vortice profile in this particular case, and that was because of the type of a distributor which was being used. Now, so with, with a computer tomography, you could, of course, obtain vortice profiles. What you'd also like to measure is the velocity profiles. And that's done using a technique called uh, CARP, Computer Automated Radioactive Particle Tracking, or RPT for short. And this uses some of the similar hardware. In this case, what one does is takes a, a particle, which is neutrally buoyant, and you have a, a radioactive source in that particle. And that particle is introduced in, in, here into the flow. Then you have a series of gamma ray detectors, which basically measure the signal of, that emitted from that particle as it passes by. So by appropriate, by measuring this data over a period of time, one can put together a time average sequence of what the flow looks like. So here's an illustration of how that's been used. This actually was used to understand the fluid mechanics in a bubble calm reactor that was uh, basically designed for a program the Department of Energy installed at Lincoln Port, Texas. And what that information was used to do is basically was used to obtain information about the liquid mixing. Here we see a series of like detectors and we can see how the response of the liquid tracer, how that behaves as a function of typical locations. And we can use that kind of information then to predict how, what is the velocity, fluid velocity profiles? What are the so-called uh, transport the coefficients, the so-called uh, diffuse transports in the system, and how those can be related back to more macroscopic type of parameters? Okay. Here you see, for example, the fluid velocity profiles. As you might expect, you have a higher velocity profile in the middle. There's a downward flow of fluid at the wall. This shows the typical voidage type of distribution of, of gas in, in, in that system. Okay, now that information uh, is used then to basically provide a validation of the so-called ensemble average um, equations for two-phase flow, in which we write the, write the momentum, the continuity, and momentum balance equations for the gas and liquid phases, as shown here. And then we couple those with the perp closures, uh, uh, things like the, uh, and also the fluid stresses. Um, the particular ones that we used are, are shown here. And that, in fact, is how we can obtain the types of velocity profiles that I showed in the previous slide. Now, what one does with those velocity profiles is you use those to extract um, axial, uh, axial dispersion coefficients as well as radial dispersion coefficients. And those are then used in a, in a convection diffusion type of equation uh, shown here which accounts then for the radial variation of, of the concentration of, of, of species. And, uh, and basically, uh, and those, so this is basically a coupling between using the microscopic equations and the more um, the two, from fluid mechanics to obtain the transport coefficients, which are used to describe the species, species transport. Okay, now we can also Use, um, use those same principles and look at the 3D behavior of, of, of columns. And some of the very first work uh, that was done is shown here. Later work has also been done and provides additional insight uh, in this case. But here we can obtain information about the, this shows the axial liquid velocity profile as a function of column radius. Again, you see the behavior. This is the CARP data. This is the two fluid model uh, uh, predictions. Okay. And this shows the predictions that would be obtained from an axial type of dispersion model that contains the radial mixing as well. But you can see how the velocity profiles are here. They're first positive in the middle, downward flow at the wall. Here we see the gas holdup as a function of, of the, from the center of the, of the reactor out here to the middle. So we get pretty good agreement between the CT data that gives the fluid holdup and the CARP data, which gives the velocity velocity profiles. Now another thing that one can do is that one can use this information to try to understand what are the mechanisms of part of, of the coalescence and breakup of, of the gas bubbles uh, in, in, in the system. And this shows some results of comparisons between some 
the CARP as well as the two fluid models which are used as, as, as a part of the study. And one can get pretty reasonable like agreement. Now, of course, one of the challenges is that taking this information, this is a 19 you know, centimeter column, how do you use this in a, in a very large scale column? And for that kind of work, one needs to use, of course, other types of instrumentation since one cannot obtain the source powerful enough to measure in such large diameter columns. Now, one of, the, one of the utilities of doing that is one can obtain information about how gas and liquid mixing occurs in the system. And what you're doing here, you're basically taking the information, uh, the model which I showed earlier, and you're introducing a liquid tracer or a gas tracer, and you're showing how that how that mixing occurs uh, in, that, in that particular system. So you can see some of the complex types of like dynamics uh, you know, which are occurring. Okay, so um, so now what one can do is you can take then the the, the measure of uh, velocity fields. So you could, you could perform those experiments over a range of different flows. Okay, and, and here we show the here we show the mean. We vary the mean of resonance time um, by changing the liquid flow. And from that, you're able to then take the corresponding uh, CARP data and translate that and obtain the corresponding uh, axial uh, the dispersion coefficients to, in an attempt to see how well the numerical or the computed values compare to those from experiments. So one gets reasonable agreement in, in what happens in that case. Okay? So like, like additional details are available here in some other sources that I can tell you. Okay, so um, just the last couple minutes, I just want to mention a little bit um, Another good application for CFD is in the, is in the circling fluid beds, reactors. And what we do in a circling fluid bed is, as I mentioned earlier, is we want to look at conversion of the hydrocarbons to, to like chemicals. And this is very important because this is a, a, a way of trying to develop processes that have reduced byproduct formation by understanding the connection between back mixing solids and gas back, back, back to the chemistry. This provides a tool for basically doing that. Okay, so so this is a little bit of the, of the background uh, behind why this work was done. The kind of the classical approach for doing this particular reaction, the oxidation of butane to molecular hydride, which is a monomer used to make polymers and other chemical intermediates. Basically, different processes have been developed. BSF and Monsanto run this in a large-scale fixed bed reactor, uh, which involves thousands of tubes and heat transfer fluid on the outside of the tube. Uh, in, in ABB or BP or, or the Mitsubishi process, the, the catalyst is contacted in like a fluidized bed, and this gives a this shows an illustration of a CFD simulation of like a 2D bed. In like the Dupont process, uh, that same chemistry is practiced in, in like a circulated fluid bed, in which the gas is contacted with the reoxidized catalyst, and the catalyst is then reoxidized after it's reduced in the regenerator zone. Now, the other question to ask is, you know, should one, what is the relative advantage of running this thing in upflow versus downflow? And that leads to the idea of what we call like a downer reactor. In this system over here, one has solids back mixing, which can reduce the selectivity to the desired product. One way to, another way to try to reduce that is to run the solids in like downflow. So the solids are more in like plug flow, and therefore they're not mixed so much with the gas. So this is the idea behind the downer. So what we did is we basically used CFD to try to predict uh, the behavior in this type of system. And in order to do that, we had to put together a number of key physics. We used, we, we used a CFD simulation to obtain the, the flow profiles for gas and solids. We used those gas and solids profiles to describe the transport of the, of the, of the species in the gas and solids phase. And we used that, and we, that was coupled also with a reaction kinetic model that was performed in separate experiments. We put all the whole thing together in order to develop a like reactor model. So uh, again, you're using a CFD model with a Wallerian Wallerian approach to describe the gas solids flows. And you go to the, you, you, you basically program, program this in either ComSol or in Fluent to get the corresponding velocity profiles. I don't have time to go into the different uh, detailed issues about closure laws, but this is very important. Um, the selection of a, of, a, of a closure law will impact out some results, and this is where having experimental tools that can help one understand what is the appropriate closure law to use is, is very important. All right, so uh, so basically what we want to just say here is just illustrate some of the results here. Here we could 
Here, there's a comparison of different closure laws, okay? You ask, well, what's the closure law to use? Well, this shows how, depending on the closure law that you use for, for drag, how does the mean velocity, solids velocity profile vary as a function of column radius, okay? Down here at the bottom is experimental data, and this are the results of various, of various closure laws, okay? So from this, we, we concluded that the an, an appropriate closure law uh, to, to use would be kind of a, what we call kind of a mod modified version of the one that Natson had like developed. So, uh, so the so the main the main message here, uh, although it looks pretty like a computer, you don't know what's right until you go out and you start making some measurements in order to try to validate this. Okay, the same thing is true down here. We look at the mean solids fraction over here. This was the mean. Uh, solids velocity. So basically this shows how the solids vary as a function of radial, like radial for position. And this shows how the how data compares to to the particular type of like closure law. And again, this gives us insight, helps us understand how should those laws be like, developed. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm getting uh, running out of time here, uh, a little too uh, like ambitious, but uh, I just wanted to show here what, how some of, of the computation fluid mechanic techniques can be used to explain and illustrate, uh, ex explain how, how the one can describe the interaction between different phases in the chemical reactant system. Now, um, let's, let's just scroll forward here just a little, a little, just a little bit. And um, we, have a, we have a publication which basically talks about that. And let's kind of get to the kind of, kind of wrap up, okay? So, when we scale up reactors, when we talk about vertical scale up, that is when we go from the laboratory to a pilot plant or to a commercial scale reactor, I think there are really several several key things. Uh, first of all, one wants to, in order to really be able to scale these up with degree of confidence, one must first of all try to capture the mix of the flow using some type of experimental technique. Once you get to a certain scale of uh, uh, methods like the ones I showed cannot be used and one must need to go to other techniques such as probes and, and other methods which allow one to basically obtain information about what happened inside of reactors, okay? Then of course with such information then you could go to CFD models and then that provides you a tool for kind of validating what the, what the experiment is basically telling you as we saw in that previous example. Just because one has a model doesn't mean the model is, of course, correct. It's going to give you results which explain what happens from an experimental point of view. But the experimental data will give you insight into how to develop and formulate the closure law. Then these things then, once we now understand the mixing, we could then translate those into, uh, into other forms, which then can be used to describe what happens when you superimpose a chemical reaction in the presence of the flow field. And typically the way we do that is we take kind of ideal reactor models, like shown here. Here's like a plug flow model in which we had two different phases flowing, but they're, uh, but they're, ex but they're changing uh, uh, with, with, with each other and they're flowing at like different, different velocities. Or we can take a stirred tank model with two different phases. And we can then put these models together to basically capture, describe what is the mixing pattern which can occur in those, uh, in, in those phases. But in the end, what we really need, and this is a message that we've been uh, talking to the companies about, is that we really need more accurate flow and mixing uh, data. And we need that in order to basically provide the validation to the type of closure laws which enter into CFD models which are used in multi-phase flows, okay? Um, and what we need to do is we need to do that on large enough scales of, of systems that, that we, we feel comfortable that when we go to from that scale to the next larger scale, that the results are not going to be impacted so much by the scale, and that the scale is basically captured through the through the appropriate physics. Okay, so um, so what what do we need? Well, in the end, if you have a lousy lousy catalyst and lousy chemistry, that's something that cannot be fixed by any reactor. Okay, so so you always need to focus on the chemistry and to ensure that work very hard in order to develop a catalyst which is going to give you the right results. So scientists in your department and other places are using molecular simulation tools. So lots of work to be done there. Uh, this has been coupled of course with experiments to provide some validation but also but in the end you ultimately need a, like a good catalyst and that must be tested in, in like a appropriate reactor. Mechanic models uh, that must be developed must really capture what happens in that system. Um, in my experience at work in industry, 
most practical process is one, they have no idea what is a kinetic model, but they know that that reactor might produce heat. Okay, but in the next gen generation processes, we still need to drive toward developing kinetic models because this is the basis upon which the reactor will operate. Okay, I think you're going to see, of course, increasing use of CFD as we understand better what are the what are the closure laws and how and how can we validate those things, particularly larger scale reactors. Which, which typically are not studied in, uh, in an academic type of atmosphere because of the limitations. But as we go to it, we can go to larger cold flow systems or hot systems where we can use appropriate probes, and we can kind of, kind of information that we need in order to validate what, it, what occurs. And what you will see also is the use of these tools to describe how commercial reactors uh, operate. Okay, we're still a, like a ways from there, and that's why people then, because of uh, time limitations, have to go to the simpler models, like the ones that I was showing on the last slide, in order to capture the gross, the gross behavior of our chemical reactors. And of course, the last one deals with sensors. There's an opportunity to develop uh, better techniques, sensors that can measure real-time information on operating reactors, in, uh, first in cold environments as well as in hot type environments. And there are lots of opportunity there to develop new like devices, which we have to use. And with that, uh, we come to a close. Um, I talked a little bit over, but uh, uh, my slides are available. There's some very good references there for you that want to go out and take a look at those. Um, I'd be delighted to um, connect you up with some other key information in this field. And I want to thank you today for your coming to the seminar. That's what thank you. Thank you. Questions right now? Because lots of reactors there. <laughs> lots of reactors equals lots of problems to solve. Right? So. The, um, you know, using the effective transport parameters is, is, is a you know an approach that's, that's that's been around for a long time. But you know, one of the possible uses of CFD is. Uh, can you actually predict like the effect of thermal conductivity from uh, you know if you, if you if you do some simple measurements of the morphology and you know what the composition of the, the solid and solid porous material is, can you actually do a good job of predicting what the effect of thermal conductivity is? Yeah. Well, I think we're working uh, in that type of direction. Like in, the, in my one slide, I showed uh, gases uh, flowing over some particles there. Okay, and and in that work. Uh, uh, the way that was done is that um, a, that that tube was filled with uh, was filled by using a random packing type of scheme. Of course, one of the complications that you like if you need to get, get into is how do those particles contact each other? Okay, because when you go to try to create a mesh, you have to have a continuous field, right? Okay, you can't have a like discontinuous uh, field uh, if you use typical typical meshing schemes. Okay. So, uh, so one of the real problems in, in trying to accurately describe the, the heat, the heat, the heat transfer problem, is how do you couple, how do you, how do you describe the contact of like particles in these in these types of beds? Contact resistance, basically. Right, exactly, right. And you can see when they're like randomly packed, especially you look at those particles I showed you with the ribs and so forth. If you look at those in an actual bed. It's, it's a very it's how they lay together and, and how they count e e e each other is the next level of like description which has to be done. Okay. You know, but can you predict the, the just take a single particle? Yep. Can you predict the accurate effective thermal conductivity for a single particle of a real of a true catalytic type material that has, you know, maybe three or four different solid Yeah. Yeah, there, actually, there there are correlations for predicting the effect the effective conductivity of, of like solids. Okay, and they include some of the key parameters uh, which make make up that solid composition. Okay, but in the end, I think you still need to do I think the experiment. Okay, because the because because the heat conduction that occurs in a real in a real catalyst particle is not is not necessarily like isotropic. Okay, because if you look how the particles are formed, they go through a dye. Okay. They're, and they're basically, you, when, they, when they go through a dye, you have a compression which occurs in the catalyst dough, which gives you a, a lower voltage at, at the skin. And as you go inside the particle, and you can see this, if you slice particles, there is a change in the particle voltage. Then the particles, when they come out of the dye, they're, they're, they're cut. Okay? And so at the point where they're cut, in, in a little, in a, there, there's like a memory effect, and you have a change in the voltage at the ends. 
And so the, really, the only way to really do this, in my opinion, and I haven't seen this done, is to take those particles and to design an appropriate experiment where you measure, where you measure the, the effect of conductivity in the, in the radial as well as the axial, axial direction. And, and if you could, you'd like to do it in like an angular, in the angular direction as well. But that hasn't been done, okay? Um, but it's, it's a very important thing because that is one of the key parameters that describes what kind of temperature gradients that one is going to obtain in a single particle, but also in the ensemble of, of, of particles. Okay? But right now, you know, because we, we don't have the tools to really do that, we, we basically uh, just take some lumped effect of conductivity. We can take it from like a correlation, uh, or, or one can do simple experiments to get a kind of a lumped value, but lumped in that value is the effect of what happens in all three, in all three dimensions. But that, that's a very interesting problem. I think there's an opportunity there to really provide some new data. Because the way that these things are made commercially, and we, we looked at those, we actually had taken particles and we, and we sliced them, we looked at them under like a microscope, and we've actually put together the 3D pore structure by doing like reconstruction. And you can see that the pore structure in these particles is really, is, it's really like three, it's, a, it's, it's like a three dimensional function. Okay, the voidage in that particle is a function of R, theta, and also Z, okay, in, in, that, in that particle. And that's going to obviously impact not only the conductivity, it's also going to affect, affect how the gases, of course, diffuse as well. Because the effective diffusion coefficient is going to be the molecular diffusion, if it's controlled by molecular diffusion, times the voidage, or the so-called like, tortuosity factor. The answer is simple, but the implementation is difficult. Yeah. What you have to do is you have to simulate the manufacturing process that produces the catalyst. Exactly. And right. then you have some prediction of your, you have to do experiments, you have a prediction of the inhomogeneity. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then you